Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Writing Life. I'm Stephen W. Long. And uh, it's interesting that each guest uh, uh, makes me think a little bit. Uh, it's a shaded response. And uh, my guest today, Garrett Robinson, made me think of the phrase, writers write. And, and that's, uh, you know, it's, it's obvious, except that, as I've said so many times, people uh, want to have written. That's not the case with Garrett. He's a writer. <clears throat> and so uh, not only uh, an author, a filmmaker as well, mm -hmm. and uh, it looks like quite prolific. So welcome, Garrett. I, I, the only thing I would push back on is I also want to have written. Yeah. I, I still sit down and do the work, but I, when I'm in the middle of it, never feels quite as good as when it's when it's done and it's out there. And you send it out. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, but I, <clears throat> I have been uh, very fortunate to have uh, produced a lot in the in the time I've been doing this. Well, I we'll get to the. I, you may be too young to know the name Jack Lalane. Oh, right. it's yeah. No, I've heard that f yeah. uh, before. It doesn't come immediately to mind, but so he he was kind of an exercise guru, and I know my mom used to watch him, and I think probably housewives would would watch him uh, yeah. do calisthenics, and and he said, I don't like to work out, but I like the results, and that's right. that's kind of you. Yes, exactly, so. exactly. I like having published books, <laughs> but in order to have them, you have to write them. You you know you've got to do it. Exactly. Okay, I really want to talk about this. But let's get the filmmaking out of the way. Okay, yeah. So tell me about that. What, what kind of films? You, I think I read that you uh, uh, kind of worked toward a more traditional approach, uh, kind of a Hollywood approach, and, it, and got tired of that. Uh, yeah, so I uh, fell in love with film right out of high school. Okay. And I, I, it was very strange. I, I ended up working <laughs> at a sound studio through no fault of my own. Mm. And the sound studio also did video production. And so they assigned me onto a video team to replace somebody who had to go home suddenly for a family emergency. Okay. And so I ended up, I was supposed to be on the shoot team for two weeks. I ended up there for two months and I completely fell in love. And it was while I was working there that I realized that, uh, and I feel like a lot of artists have this realization, th that people had made my favorite movies. Uh, for some reason, right, I thought, right, they, right. You know, yeah, I thought I, they were this thing I that totally just sort of materialized. Yep. And then it became real to me that, oh my gosh, people actually make these movies. And then it became something that I wanted to do. So I worked for a number of years uh, trying to make it on the independent film scene. And I tried everything. I worked in sound. I worked behind the camera and everything. Um, I, I did try acting. That was not for me, even though I had enjoyed high school drama. Uh -huh. And what I fell in love with was directing. Directing is absolutely my thing. But if you want to take a, an industry that's extremely hard to get into, and then if you want to pick the job in that industry right. that is the hardest to get into, it's directing far and away. Okay. So I got to direct some films. Uh, some of them are even out there. You can find them on YouTube. You can, you can actually pay for some of them on Amazon. Uh, not that that's a big source of income. But <clears throat> what I wanted to do was I wanted to make big science fiction and fantasy films. Okay. And it just wasn't happening for the longest time. Uh, because you can get a budget of, uh, you can get a budget of uh, $5,000 together on Kickstarter and make a really intimate, very emotional drama. And, and I, I did, I did that a few times and it was great. It was, it was tremendously fulfilling, but it wasn't exactly where I wanted to go. And you can't transition from that sort of work into right. epic fantasy. Okay. So, my friend one day just said, you've, you've been writing uh, these stories and creating these stories as scripts. Mm -hmm. Why don't you try turning them into books? Because Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I sort of envisioned it the other way around. I, I thought the books maybe came first, but no. No, it was, well, it, in, in terms of the overall timeline, when I was a teenager, I thought I wanted to be an author. Okay. And I, you know, I, I, I you did that. ended up doing it. Uh, but... It was, it was out of high school that I found filmmaking, and that became, uh, honestly, truly my first love. It, one day, I will get the opportunity to probably turn these into movies, which would be uh, the product of, you know, m many years of work. And at, right. at that point, I'm just going to dive into it head first because okay. that, is, that is just something that I love. But the way that my friend pitched it to me was, imagine if you could walk into a Hollywood pitch meeting yeah. and say, I have a script that's based on a best-selling book that right. I also wrote, so I own the rights to it. Right. So if you want to produce the movie, uh, which any studio worth their salt would want to do if it's a New York Times bestseller, sure. let's say. Sure. Um, but then I can say, if you want to produce the movie, then you, you have to bring me on as well. 
uh, well, kind of a side note to that, Dances with Wolves mm -hmm. was a screenplay and the author was a friend of Kevin Costner who told him that'll never get made like that. Right. Write a book and then we'll make the screenplay from the book, which yeah. is a little subterfuge maybe, but. Totally. I mean, it's a, whatever you can do to make yourself more appealing, especially in that world. It, it applies if you're going the traditional publishing route as well. But if you have some, some things, some clout, uh, that just makes people uh, much more attracted to working with you. Sure. Yeah. So back up just a minute. You said you can't make the transition, that you've done the drama, yeah. but that doesn't transition. Is that a matter of budget? It's a matter of budget, and also there is a, this, this was my experience, and this is not everybody's experience. There, there was an experience in filmmaking that you are the last thing you made. Right, right. Uh, you really have to find somebody who's willing to take an unusual chance on you if you have only made drama and then you want to transition to okay. uh, something like fantasy. Uh, so my, you know, people don't like to make lists of their favorite anything, books, movies, whatever, but I can say without question, my favorite movie of all time is Lord of the Rings. Okay. And that's also my favorite book. I'm a, it's just, I mean, look at what I write. You right, know, right. But uh, Peter Jackson, it took him a very long time to get a studio to trust him to make those films because he started off making um, kind of schlocky horror movies. Really? And w what he did to make that move was he perfected his special effects. And he said, listen, I can do special effects when it comes to horror. I've got a whole special effects house who knows how to work with me. Mm -hmm. And here is a demo scene or two oh, really? of, of how we would treat this material. And of course, it's Lord of the Rings. It's the best-selling book of the 20th century, et cetera, et cetera. And that was how the studio, uh, you know, was willing to take the chance on here's this guy who's only directed horror films. Right. We'll give him a huge budget to make these movies. But even then, he had to go through every studio in Hollywood. He had gone to he had gone to uh, straight to Warner Brothers. He'd gone to Paramount. Um, everybody and finally New Line was the one mm -hmm. who was they, they said okay we'll we'll give this a shot and I mean that panned out quite well for them it's it's interesting the hit and miss aspect of that uh, New Line hit it yeah uh, I read a, an interview with the uh, uh, the publisher who turned down um, Harry Potter Harry Potter oh man that story yeah <laughs> so what are you gonna do yeah you take you take your best shot well um, Life of Pi, do you know that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a friend of mine, her agent, her not agency, but the guy, he, yeah. he turned that down. He said, I can't imagine anybody reading this. Oof. So, And it really is, which is maybe another topic, but uh, I think this will resonate with you. It really is a matter of taste yeah. sometimes. Very much so. And I think not to denigrate the public, but uh, I think sometimes they don't know what, I mean, there's there's so much to choose from. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Well, you get a recommendation from a friend or you, the radio or something. Absolutely. And somebody says, "Hey, this is really great." And then you say, "Oh, then I'll pony up twenty nine bucks and I'll buy the book, or or I'll right. go see the movie." Exactly. And yeah. and I know uh, from personal experience and from so many stories that I've been told that traditional publishing houses, the big ones, yeah. and the big Hollywood studios, they also know. There, there's always going to be bud, uh, duds and there's always going to be bombs. Sure. But they know that to a degree, they can kind of make anything they want and they've got a marketing framework where they can probably turn that into money. Right. So it really does come down to the producer's taste as well or the publisher's taste. Yeah. What are they in the mood for? Because what they're, they, they, they do take consideration of what they think the public is looking for. But once they've decided they want something, they themselves start to own the idea of, I can make this make money, yeah. you know, uh, as opposed to I'm not going to buy it unless I think it's going to make money. They right. actually, they, they think about it a different way. Well, and I'm glad because there's a certain amount of not, I mean, ego would be one word, but self-confidence. Yeah. You know, if you say I'm good at what I do, yeah. I, I understand this market and I can do it. I have a friend who uh, is now retired, but he was a special effects director. Oh, wow. And he said... Uh, in fact, he's actually in uh, the, the original Star Wars and so on. Really? But yeah. Okay, I'll just go ahead. He's a, in the cantina scene. He's the character playing his nose. No way. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, I love. I, I love yeah. any chance I get to meet people like yeah. that. They have the best stories. He's but. he's dead. Uh, Dave Carson. Oh just, wow. Just terrific. That's a fun 
story that I like to tell. <laughs> <laughs> but he, anyway, he was telling me that Hollywood, the fat part of the market is really males, and I think it's kind of 18 to 35. Yeah, eight, that, 18 to, yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that's, and I, which is limiting, obviously, and not necessarily what I like, but uh, they didn't ask me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, it's definitely true of Hollywood. It's interesting that in uh, publishing, it's pretty much the same age bracket, but it's women, 100%. Women read more than men by a, a very, very large margin. Um, that was a mistake I made. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and not to dive into uh, it early, but um, I, I, one thing that I realized from existing in the fantasy fan reader right, space right. for so long yeah. is that, is that um, a large part of the publishing industry has not been serving them when it comes to fantasy. When you talk to a lot of traditional publishers, they do have these pretty old-fashioned ideas really? of, oh, well, women only really want to read romance. So we'll publish romance, we'll market that to women. And and there are these there are these uh, uh, girls and women and all of all age ranges that I've met who are like, you know, I love Lord of the Rings. I love uh, the Wheel of Time or the Sword of Truth or any of these amazing. Twilight. Uh, well, that's not that's less epic fantasy. They're okay. talking about epic fantasy, okay. sword and sorcery. Okay. I love these stories, but you know, where are, where are the ones? Those ones were clearly written for uh, a more male audience. Okay. Um, which is you know, if that's who you want to write for, that's that's totally fine. But they said, where is where is like more of our epic fantasy? Right. Um, and it's not, you know, I don't, I don't do it the exact opposite, but I try to keep that in mind with everything that I create. Sure. I try to have a more even balance of characters. Ironically, even though they're not the best at this in general, the Game of Thrones books actually have a fantastic range of female characters okay. who have the same <clears throat> amount of energy and agency that only the male characters do in other fantasy okay. series. I was going to say used to have, but they, I think what you're saying is they still have. They have a blind spot when they do that. Yeah. That, that you need to open that up. Yeah, which is, and I think it comes from a similar attitude that the film industry has when it comes to uh, things like action movies, and I feel like that's changing in the film industry. I hope that it's changing in the publishing industry yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you said you didn't want to get ahead of us, but that was a great segue, because <laughs> I want to. I, I actually. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not as knowledgeable as you're going to be about this. So if you take a category or a genre, mm -hmm. and that is, let's say, fantasy, you can slice that, right? I mean, oh, you can slice it. Can, 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 you, can you talk a little bit about that, about what, what, what is epic? Is it just big? Or is um, there something else to that? It definitely requires a bit of, uh, yeah, it's definitely a matter of scope. Okay. Um, so, uh, Lord of the Rings, epic fantasy. You've got so many kingdoms. You've got so many characters. Okay. Um, you've got uh, a sense, no matter, one thing that I consider kind of a requirement of epic fantasy is no matter how big the world is within the pages of the book, there's also always a sense that the world expen extends beyond those pages. Bigger than that. Right. When you read <clears throat> Lord of the Rings, you get such a sense of the history of the world and the extent of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, as opposed to uh, Harry Potter, you kind of just get what you get in the book. There's some mention. You know of, that's interesting, and right? and and uh, uh, observant on your part. I'd never thought of it like that, but mm -hmm. yeah, because that's you actually go to that world. Right. The the world outside that world is the ordinary world that we know. Yeah, and everything. Uh, everything in Harry Potter is kind of explained in the moment that it, it that okay. it arrives, uh, down to the titles of the textbooks, uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. You might want to know more about that textbook from the school, but you kind of get what it's about just from the title. Right. Whereas in Lord of the Rings or in The Sword of Truth uh, or um, oh, what's the other Wheel of Time. Uh, you always have people making references to, and then of course there was the there was the Dark War of the Witch King, and then they just move on. And if you're a careful reader, you're going, "What? What, Wait a what was that? <laughs> I want. I want, That sounds interesting. I, I would like to know more about that. Right. Right. I love that. Um, but then even within the genre of uh, uh, with it, there's there's different ways to divide genres, and some of them cross over. So. Uh, even if you created a world like Harry Potter that was epic fantasy, that would still not be medieval fantasy. 
So you can have epic fantasy that's medieval fantasy or epic fantasy that isn't. Uh, this is very medieval fantasy. Okay. And uh, a, a, a primary uh, part of that is, you know, it's it's of that time period. You've got no, you've got horses everybody rides around okay. on. You've got armor and swords and bows and arrow and castles, um, as opposed to more modern uh, fantasy, even if it's epic in scope. If it happens in the 20th century and you've got wizards and cell phones, that's not medieval fantasy. Right. So there's there's so many ways to divide it down. Um, and the truth is that to most readers, it doesn't matter. It's actually pretty much all marketing. Because when it comes to epic fantasy, I can tell people it's epic fantasy along the lines of The Lord of the Rings and The Wheel of Time. And the person hearing that, they already know if they like those series. Okay. So they're willing to give it a shot. Um, it's almost your elevator speech. Correctly. In a sense, uh, yeah. Correct, exactly. Yeah. You, you, you don't need to, when you're creating it, you don't need to worry about all that stuff. That's when you, that's when you start getting to the business side. If you are self-publishing or independently publishing, if you're pitching it to an agent, you want to be able to tell them, D don't ever be that person who goes out and says, oh, well, my, my book, it kind of defies genre. And uh, you, can't really, you can't really put it into a category. It's like, well, then I'm not interested. Exactly. I want to know what it's similar to. Because my job is selling it, and I can't sell that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you, can, you can break genres. Just don't tell that to the person whose job it is right. to sell your book right. for you. Going back to Harry Potter, I guess before that, that genre was not in favor. No, and, not at all. Which is, we were talking about turning it down, and that was why, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they, they must have just looked at the manuscript and said, what is this like? What is, right. what is, what is this, what am I supposed to relate this to? Who, yeah. it, what fans is this for? Um, and so I don't think that that should be a primary consideration when you're creating your story. Right. Um, but again, it's going to go, it's going to come afterwards. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a combination of that and the strength of your actual work that's going to determine whether people are interested. It all, well, I hope it always comes back to that. It, yeah. It, it's the quality of, of the work. It should. It doesn't always. It doesn't always. There are, there are people who, you know, I would, I would never name in a million years, but there are people out there uh, publishing books right now, and every time they put out a new book, I give them another shot, and I pick it up, and I'm just like, oh. It's not good, but they're successful. My, uh, I, I had a, a teacher who commented on one of those people who we're not going to name, mm -hmm. and she said, I think he's writing past his sell-by date. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little stale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know what? It, that is always going to come down to personal preference. Of course. Uh, so fair play to them, and I don't begrudge anybody their success unless they're Unless they're an awful person in some other way, but somebody who's just—it's not. Yeah, in that know. case, it's not the work because right. because they do have an audience. There's certainly successful authors who, that I just don't care for, right. and that's if I just choose something else. Not my that, thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's okay. You had mentioned something, and, and just not to go too crazy on this, but the the term self-published and the term independent. What I don't know what that means. Okay, so this is a this is. Totally getting into one of my personal pet peeves. Okay. Uh, I got into self-publishing. That okay. is how I started. Sure. And I was attracted to self-publishing because I had been trying for so long to break into the traditional publishing, uh, sorry, the traditional film industry, right. that the idea of going on another long journey to break into tr traditional publishing was just, it's I was so an tired. Another, yeah. Right. I was so tired just thinking of it. Um, but... What you get in self-publishing is you get freedom, you get uh, to keep all of your rights, you get a much larger portion of every book sale, and right. you, you lose some reach, obviously. That's, right. the, that's the whole point of <clears throat> traditional publishers. Off. Right. Yep. We will sell your book to way more people, and you will get 15% uh, or 10% of every book sale. Right. Uh, in uh, self-publishing, you will sell to much fewer people, but you get 100% of every book right. sale. So... Uh, and that, that's all very, that's, that's the reason that I still do it. But I drifted away from my endearment of, uh, my endearment with the term self-publishing because the other thing that traditional publishers offer, and they don't always do it well, and there, there are still bad books that get through them. Sure. But they assure some certain minimum standard of quality. I'm with you, yeah. And in self-publishing, uh, 
the, the vast majority of self-published authors, uh, hopefully myself included, care so deeply about their work. You bet. And they care to make sure that it's all as, as good as they can possibly make it. They get the best editors that are available to them. They get the best covers. But there is a segment of it, uh, of, that, of, of that group, who literally self-publish. They write it themselves. Right. They yeah. edit, the, edit it themselves. They have a copy machine. Right. <laughs> um, and they, they don't care about editing. They don't care about their covers right. or any of that stuff. And I, I just, um, I think that it's not only bad for them in their careers, but I think it hurts the rest of us. Because if, some, if I tell somebody that I'm self-published and they have tried a few self-published books before. That's their experience. That's their experience. Yeah, that's and I don't all want they know. That. Right. right. So I, I love independent. Uh, I, I love the word independent and indie. Uh, I loved it when I was in the film industry. Sure. And I prefer it when it comes to publishing. I am an author who is published by a publishing company yeah. that I just also happen to own. Right. And now we're publishing other people too. Well, and look at the quality of this. I, I, I wanted to get into this. You talked about the covers and so on. Yeah. And the, <clears throat> before we started here today, you uh, talked a little bit about, you said you have three uh, artists? Yeah, that... three artists. Uh, they are international. And so what's funny enough is they, <laughs> this is apropos of nothing, uh, but they are from three different places in the world. Right. And for some reason, they all moved to Thailand. We really? Didn't, we didn't find them through each other or anything. We found them all through independent online search. It was, it's the wildest coincidence I've ever experienced in my life. Right. And if it hadn't happened to me, I wouldn't believe it. Right. But, uh, but they're fantastic. Uh, and their styles, that we, we wanted a, a level of quality. And we, we wanted go. their yeah. styles. There you go. So uh -huh. we wanted their styles to be close enough to each other right. that, they would, that they would work well together. So it, what's on the screen right now, uh, the top left... And the top middle covers were done by one artist. Okay. The bottom middle cover was done by a second artist. And then the top right and bottom left covers were done by the third artist. Okay. Uh, the bottom right cover is my literary novel I put out a while ago. Um, it has, uh, I, that was the one book that I truly said, I'm going to write this for me, and I'm not going really? to care okay. about. I'm not going to care what anybody else thinks about it. Consequently, it has uh, it has not been my bestseller, and I'm not interested in writing literary fiction. I feel like once every ten years, okay, I'll have a literary fiction novel that really needs to come out. Yeah, and in the meantime, I write these, which are written for me, but also for my audience. Right, you know, right. finding that mix. But uh, but the artists are fantastic. Well, yeah, and as you can see there. Uh, before we run out of time, I really want to talk to you about your process. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on your website, you were talking about you can have it all in a sense. You can have a career and the family and everything. And in fact, you said, I have a career because I have a family. Right. They need to eat. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, <clears throat> when, you're, when you're writing, when, let's say that you're, you, it's time to come out with another book and, and you sit down, you're going to do that. Is this. Part of it is marketing, I guess, or part of it is commercial. You're thinking about, uh, yeah, you need to sell this thing. Mm -hmm. But then, do you come into this with a kind of an inkling, if this is a standalone and not a continuation of something else? Mm. Um, what motivates you? What inspires you? Where, where, do this, where does this come from? Well, I, I think that in this, uh, in this, profession, whether you are independent or whether you go with a traditional publisher, you have to wear two hats and right. you have to take them off and on, um, not, not, not just at one point. Gotcha. So I, I sit down and I, I start fleshing out my ideas before I start the actual work. Okay. Once I've got the ideas, take off the art hat, put on the business hat and okay. say, how is this going to be more um, appealing? And that modifies the existing work, but you have to start with that existing work. I don't I'm sure there are some people who do it out there in a way that's not skeezy, but it feels very skeezy when someone sits down right. and goes, what is going to sell? I agree. Because if you don't even like the genre, I, I see this all the time. Where it's people, like paint by numbers. Right. Yeah. And they decide, I see people all the time who decide that they are going to write romance because romance uh, readers are very voracious. Right. And they sit down, they write, they actually can get successful doing it. And then they go, okay, now that I'm successful, now I'm going to go write fantasy or sci-fi or whatever I really wanted but to I write in the first to, place. Yeah. They can't 
they can't transition. They're right. audi they've built this audience, and it, it results in them feeling certain ways and being disdainful of their audience in a way that really makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. So for me, it always has to start with what do I want to create and then I go, all right, and how can I make this something that's going to be more appealing? Well, that, you know, and, and that makes a lot of sense. There, there's a, a, I think I'm going to say this correctly, and again, this is not to demean any approach, but I think the name of the book is The Marshall Plan, and the guy who wrote the book, his right. name is Marshall. Yeah. And it's like, Heard by, of that. by page 23, you need a conflict. And, <laughs> right. and, and on page 52, there needs to be some resolution. And, mm -hmm. and obviously, the, I'm making that up. Right. But it, it was... Uh, I, I looked at that when I was trying to get started, yeah. and I thought, if this is what I have to do, I have no interest in it. Right. <laughs> it, there's there's no spontaneity. There's no joy in that. You're just filling in the blanks. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't want to do that. I I actually have uh, read a bunch <clears throat> of advice like that, which I will I will actually start out with in the beginning because. There are certain things that, like, you you should have a first, second, and third act. And those breaks should be clear and everything like that. So I'll, I'll fill in sort of and get to the point where I've got uh, maybe three or four pages of outline that's been very sort of much uh, a little bit by the numbers. And then I take the book and I throw it away and I go, all right, now how do I make this something that I'm actually going to care about, right. that I really love, and that becomes... And then all the structure gets... So I feel like that's laying a foundation upon which then you actually design the right. house. Right. Um, so I, again, like you said, there's, a, there's as many ways to approach writing a book as there are writers. writers. Um, and I feel like it's just got to start from... So do you think that your work is plot-driven or character-driven? Uh, it's... Uh, okay, so the way and that you I can, always... Yeah, and it can be both. Yeah, so, well, it's, it's a little bit of both. Okay. Um, it's plot-driven but the characters are in the driver's seat. I always start with characters, right. okay. and characters are well, always the most... Well, that tells me it's character-driven. Right. Yeah. Um, but the, the, to me, Stephen King famously loves his characters and, and says, I would never ruin a book with plot. And I'm yeah. like, well, but then what do the characters do? How do, we, how do we figure out who a character is if nothing happens to them and right. if they don't do anything? And it's like, well, obviously something happens to them and they do something. Well, that's plot. <laughs> right, yeah. So I, I start with the character and I go, what's going to be the most interesting person? Who do, I, who do I want to tell a story about? And then what is going to take them to the limit? What is going to make them question themselves? What right. is going to pit them against the forces uh, that exist in their life the most? And, and that's my plot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... so I, I love the the words. Uh, to me, that's character driven, or that's the way that I w was taught. And I have to comment on uh, Stephen King, or really any of these very successful authors who say something, mm -hmm. and as if it's bizarre, and really it's not. Yeah. Uh, and what I mean by that is, I think he if he says he doesn't plot, and that's not really true. Right. I think I think he <laughs> I think. Either consciously or subconsciously, he knows kind of where that's going. Mm -hmm. Now, you can work it out as you go, but I think he kind of knows. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I think he's, I mean, he's written enough books by this point that he sits down. And I He'll think have it, just, it any day now. Yeah, it all, yeah. It all flows naturally. It's yeah. all just pop, 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 and then, and then this, and then this, and then this. And he, uh, he's, you know, boy, he's great. And, and anybody like that, I mean, including me way more so than somebody like Stephen King or Lee Childs, um, just take the advice with a grain of salt. If it helps you get to the end oh, of sure. your book, you know, sure. then uh, then it's good advice. And yeah. if it stops you from writing or makes you, uh, you know, makes you less pleased with your product personally in any way, product, like, makes you less pleased with the final result <laughs> right. in any way, toss it out the window. Your creation. How about yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. There you go. Yeah. You know. No, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, we're out of time. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank that you was so much. Terrific. I, I, I love. Uh, I love that you're so active. I love yeah. that you're prolific. Thank you. Yeah. It's a. It's a lot of fun. It's, I like this job more than any I've ever had. Yeah. It's an inspiration to me as well. Thank you, folks. That's it. Boy, that was fun. <laughs> uh, tune in again. Uh, this is the Writing Life. I'm Stephen W. Long. You can write to me at my website, stephenwlong.com. Write to Garrett. I think you're happy to write back. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Find me on YouTube as well. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah. So I think uh, Caroline had that up there. Cool. Uh, folks, thanks. We'll see you next time on The Writing Life.
done? I don't know. You guys want to do one yeah, just with yourself? Yeah, I mean, they think we're done. No, they got no, enough. No. They got no. enough. They got enough? Probably. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Let's go have, let's go lunch. I'm, oh. I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can just bite too.